Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Good Stuff. My name is Kevin Billy, and I'm pleased to announce today's guest, assistant men's basketball coach at Ohio State University, Ryan Peden. Thanks for coming on, Ryan. Hey, thanks for having me, Kevin. Yeah, it's good to see you. Um, I know our paths go back, uh, man, I don't know, I didn't even think about it, but probably 15, 16, well, maybe even longer now, probably 16, 17 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I want to give you the opportunity at least to share your path up to this point and kind of the places you've been. I know uh, a, a lot of people probably don't know that you pulled that old purple Lexus onto the Notre Dame College lot, and I uh, was <laughs> one of the first to offer you a job, and you denied me. But nonetheless, I think you made the right decision, and uh, so we're here today. But yeah, kind of kind of tell us, uh, you know, starting maybe from playing at Worcester to, to where you went after that with coaching. Sure. So, um, first of all, thanks for having me on today. This is this is cool. Um, I've really uh, enjoyed. I haven't watched all of them, but I've watched a couple of your um, you know, sessions here, and I think they're great, and uh, um, I've learned a lot from them, and we'll look forward to continue watching them, too, so um, anyhow, uh, yeah, I played college basketball at the College of Worcester, uh, was there for four years, graduated in the year 2000, and uh, which seems like a long time ago now, and um, uh, went uh, from there, was fortunate enough to get a graduate assistantship at uh, Miami University, so it was actually through the grad school and my basketball uh, responsibilities uh, were completely volunteer. So um, uh, it, it, it was it was a great looking back, a great time period in my life. I learned a lot and, uh, you know, was grinding through those early years. Uh, from there, I went to Kent State, was there for three years under Jim Christian. Those were his first three years as head coach. They were coming off of an elite eight appearance in uh, 2002. So I was there on the heels of that. Um, was there for three years, and then Charlie Coles hired me back at Miami of Ohio as a full-time assistant, which uh, that was my first true break in the business. And uh, so there I was, age 28, and uh, finally had a you know full-time assistant coaching job. So that was great. Was there for five years. Uh, went from there to University of Toledo and joined Todd Kowalczyk's first staff there at Toledo, um, which taught me a, a heck of a lot about building a program. Uh, left there in 2013 to join John Gross at the University of Illinois. Um, I'm indebted to him for a lot of reasons, but, um, um, you know, learned a lot there. Uh, that was a different sort of uh, environment for me, the different than being a part of a mid-American conference team uh, or school uh, program. But that, that was, uh, you know, first time being at the high major level. So taught me a lot there. I left there in 2015, went to Butler. I was at Butler for two seasons before Coach Holman got the job here at Ohio State and now going into, uh, well, finishing our third season here at Ohio State. And um, yeah, so now 20, 20 years later, yeah. uh, I'm talking to you on a video <laughs> podcast, man, so. Yeah, right, that's great. Well, I, I think probably the most obvious thing that sticks out to me and and I've been fortunate once again to stay in touch with you. I, I remember Miami, Ohio practicing up at Notre Dame College for the MAC tournament, to coming down and watching Kent State practices, to actually playing a game against you guys, to stopping at Toledo on the way to Michigan, recruiting to see practices, and uh, never really, you know, saw anything in Illinois or Butler. Of course, was down just this past year with you at Ohio State. So the, the thing that just sticks out to me right away, Ryan, is you've been around some really good coaches. You know, even from Coach Moore that you played for. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so what are the things that stick out to you? Like, what are some of the characteristics that, that make those guys so good at what they do? Well, I, you know, there, there, there are a few common similar, you know, common traits that I would say they're very similar uh, with, with all of them. I also have, um, you know, first of all, very privileged to have worked for all those guys. Uh, even like you said, coach Moore, coach Moore is the second all time winningest coach in the history of division three college basketball so he's a living legend um and had a, you know opportunity to work for some some great coaches man um and the thing i lo looking back on you know my career to this point is i think i'm most thankful that i've worked for great coaches but that each of them were uniquely different um i've worked in some different coaching trees um and personalities that were so different. Coach uh, Coles at Miami of Ohio was um, so unique, um, old school, um, rooted in uh, what he really truly believed in at the core of, of his 
uh, basketball, uh, you know, foundation. And he stuck to that. He wouldn't, he wouldn't, uh, you know, he wouldn't stray from that. And, uh, you know, I think, I think some of the, some of the, you know, things that I've noticed over time is number one, uh, you have to be authentic. And I think in their own ways, every coach I've worked for is very authentic um, and sort of true to who they are. Working for John Gross is com about as complete polar opposite as you could get to working for Charlie Coles. Um, and I say that with all, um, you know, gratitude and, and in terms of, you know, both of them are very, very different, but um, each very unique and true to who they are as people. So um, Todd Kowalczyk was, was uh, you know, I, I always say this about him. He was as organized and, um, you know, he's more of a, a almost like a CEO, uh, um, more so than any coach I had worked for. Um, and he's great in the community in terms of uh, raising money for his program and how he operates his budget and uh, how he's so fiscally responsible and taught me a lot from that angle um, in terms of fundraising, things like that. And tremendous, you know, tremendous coach. I learned a ton from him offensively, but um, yeah, I think I, th I would say that uniqueness and authenticity, I think were, are two things that stand out. And I think intelligence, which is a, which is a key component, um, you know, each of those guys has a, a, a level of intelligence that is high level. And uh, I think that carries over, you know, to your, your coaching style on the floor, but also, um, you know, how you run and operate a program on a day-to-day -day basis off the floor. Right. Well, I, I think that's pretty cool that you've had all these different experiences and be able to work for all these people. I mean, because that, that'll kind of shape and mold you over time, I'm sure, in, in, in your philosophy. Um, what, what about players wise then, you know, it, I guess it would be almost the same question. You, you've been around some really good players at different levels. So regardless of the level, you know, they, they've been elite there. What is the separator there? What, what have you seen that sticks out? So if, if somebody's listening to this, regardless if they're a coach, if they're a player, if they're an employee, you know, what is something that they can take away from this to, to inject into their life if it's not there now to, to have that, you know, to have that style, if you will. Sure. I, th I think, you know, if I, if I were to say one, maybe two different characteristics that the best players I've ever been around, obviously uh, talent is, is a non-negotiable. I mean, we all know that, uh, you know, the best players are often the most talented, but not always. Um, but the best players that I've been around um, are probably the most competitive guys that I've ever coached to. And, um, being competitive on game night is one thing, but being competitive um, with yourself in the off season is a whole different thing. Being competitive on a daily basis in practice. Um, the great ones, you don't have to prod them. You just don't. You don't. They have a fire burning. They have a, a desire within them. And they have, they're reaching uh, for, for, for things that um, – you know, may not be right in front of them, but maybe down the road. I can always remember uh, when I first got to Kent State, this was uh, right after Trevor Huffman had graduated. And I was amazed uh, watching him in the gym. He had trash cans out there every single day. This is after he graduated uh, in the gym. And he was using those trash cans as defenders. And um, I just thought that was like, it was a little thing, but it was, it taught me so much about him um, using his his competitive spirit and his imagination uh, in the off season to to you know use trash cans as as defenders um, and he he just had an imagination about him that was that was awesome in the way he worked. Um, Tim Pollitz is a guy that sticks out at Miami of Ohio had the same type of thing competitive spirit um, outworked guys uh, in the off season and that was you know that was a reason that he improved and um, became something far bigger than anybody ever would have thought uh, at Miami of Ohio and took us to the tournament in 2007. So I would say, I would say uh, those are some things that come to mind, competitiveness. And then the other characteristic that I would uh, throw in there too is maturity. And I've been around a lot of different um, types of players, talented, uh, some maybe less talented, but they achieved more. Um, 
I think a common denominator that I've noticed is their maturity. And it's an undervalued trait um, because, uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of avenues for young, young guys to be uh, immature and get lost in things that maybe aren't as important in this day and age. And um, I think the mature um, players are able to sort of navigate that a little bit better and not become distracted and keep a focus on the things that are really important to and becoming great and developing uh, to the best of their ability. Yeah, that's great insight. I guess the first one, the competitiveness, I, I love that because I, I do feel like those guys respect the process and they're intrinsically, they're, they, they are just able to do it. You know, I know I deal with that with our boys right now. One's a self-starter and one's not, the other one's too young yeah. to realize, but that, that is a good thing. Now let's go with the maturity thing. I like what you just said there. And, and I remember when I was a college coach, Ryan, people would ask me what the worst part of the job was. And I said, well, they're 18 to 22 year olds. I never know what they're going to do. Sure. So, you know, the big part of it's recruiting. And for you guys, you know, recruiting changes. I feel like it goes in phases every couple of years. You know, we were just talking on the phone the other day about you know, how you got to recruit them. Once again, they come to campus because all these kids are leaving. But yeah. like walk us through that process of, of recruiting, because I don't think I don't think people realize, and, and this could almost be related to me in the business world of interviewing. I know it's not going to take as long, but I think you're looking for certain things to see if people are a fit in your company, just like you're looking for certain things to see if they're a fit for your team. Yep. So, you know, walk us through what that process looks like. I know that could be a year, that could be three years. And then of course, you know, what, what you're looking for, you know, let's just go with currently right now, because when I watch Ohio State from the outside in, you know, I just see a well-oiled machine in terms of what you guys want, the type of people that you bring into your program. Um, you know, so, so let us into that a little bit, if you will, please. It's vitally important. I, I think, you know, I can tell you there's a lot of things that are really important to um, having a championship caliber program and building a culture and sustaining a culture and all of that. Um, I think talent acquisition is as important probably the most important thing. And it's not for us and the way we do it, we're, we've said this you know, to recruits on the telephone, we're not trying to um, build a talent factory here. We're trying to um, bring guys into our family that are talented, that fit who we are and what we wanna be all about. So it's our job as assistant coaches to get to the bottom of that. And um, you know, I think the first thing I would mention is it's, it's in, it's imperfect. Okay. This is, there's no, no one's batting a thousand. I think the Ohio state football program is uh, as well oiled of a machine as, as there is in college football. And I, you know, what a resource for us to be able to pick those guys brain and figure out how they, how they go about uh, acquiring their talent. But um, you know, you, you, you're not going to know everything and, and there's going to be mistakes and there's going to be certain guys that develop more than you thought. And there's going to be certain right. guys that don't develop as well as you thought. Um, and there, is, there are characteristics that, that are vitally important to um, not just being successful at the college or pro level, but uh, there's characteristics that are uh, important to and that correlate to improvement. Um, and so we try to identify those things. And uh, what, what may be important in our program doesn't necessarily um, mean that it's going to be the same for another program. Um, so, you know, you have to be true to who you are, understand what's most important and the types of things that are important. Um, I have a good story here, like, or, or anecdote. Anyhow, I was talking with a, a scout uh, of an NBA team last week. Um, I don't want to mention the team, but, you know, one of the things he's the, the lead scout for their organization. And one of the things that he said, Kevin, um, that, that caught my attention and that we've actually passed on to our players and our team was, he said, he has made it mandatory that one of his questions or two of his questions um, that he and his scouts always ask of college coaches or anyone that they talk to as they're trying to get Intel on college players is uh, do they return phone calls and do they return texts? And, and you say, man, why is something like that? Uh, does, why does that even matter? And I don't think it matters 100% of the time, like any of these characteristics. Uh, you can't base everything on one 
one facet, but um, I, I, I think what it does tell you is, are they responsible? Are they respectful? Are they organized? Um, are they on top of things? Um, how is their relation, you know, are there, are there relation, are they capable of building a relationship with them? Yeah. But we have plenty of guys that we recruit that um, we may text or call and it's, you know, it'd be easier to get a hold of the president of the United States <laughs> right. than, than that particular recruit. So um, I thought that was really interesting. And certainly there's a lot of different things that we look for, but um, I think at the end of the day, you, you have to be true to, you know, who you are as a culture and what's important to you. Well, and I think with that being said, there's just times where, you know, you got to say no, or you got to back out. And, and I know, I think of a story when I was a coach that maybe could relate to you. I, I think it was five, six years in and having that culture already established. And, and I made an exception because of talent. <laughs> I knew it probably wasn't going to be a fit, but I thought, man, I'll just do this because it's really talented. Well, mm -hmm. come October, November, when we got in the gym, Every day, I think the team, the coaches, probably everybody knew that one individual bothered me. <laughs> you know, and that wasn't fair to the rest of the team. So I think that's probably hard sometimes for you guys. You, you, you find a talented player, but it's just not a fit. Yeah, you have to balance it. You have to balance it. What, 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 uh, how important is that going to be to you, Kevin? Because he may frustrate you in practice, but on game nights, he may make you really happy. Yeah, and, this is true. You know, uh, so <clears throat> you got to know yourself. I know for us um, – my boss, and this is, this is part of the reason I love working for him, and, and he said, I will never um, change. And he says, I want to be able to coach to my convictions. And when I can't, um, that's when I'm getting out. And so there's a lot that goes into that. I think um, people on the outside probably have no clue, no understanding of that at all. Um, but it's, it's like running a company um, or, you know, being in charge of an organization, um, you know, your values should, should permeate from the day-to-day -day life. And that's not just from the leadership. That should be uh, evident uh, in the people that work for you or for us, the people that play for us. Yeah, that's great. I, I don't want to get sidetracked, but just sticking back a little bit to the recruiting thing, I, I'd be anxious to hear from you, you know, the social media aspect. I, I think that can be such a positive thing, and I'm sure it could be such a negative thing. Where, where do you sit on that, if you will? Well, I, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. It's something that we talk a lot about, and it's ever-changing in this world, obviously. Um, it's becoming a bigger part of uh, culture and, uh, you know, society today. Um, and, um, you know, I think that we want to be aware of social media and how uh, they're behaving on social media, the types of things that they're saying, um, how they're acting. I think I've heard this analogy before that, um, you know, if you go to someone's social media page, uh, it's like having a resume. It's like having your presenting your resume. This is who I am. Um, this is what I'm all about. And I don't want to be overly judgmental, but I think that's a big part of our job is to be judgmental and to, uh, always have our antennas up and be able to um, take inventory of what messages are being sent. Um, and that's no different than walking into a room and conversing with someone, you know, it's a different way of communicating, but it says a lot about you in terms of who you are, what you're all about and um, you know, what you value. So I think we're, we're very in tune with that. Um, we'll be judgmental uh, to a point, but um, I think that, you know, one, one important thing to remember, too, is if you're recruiting young men that are behaving differently on social media than what your organization or your team or your program is all about, um, at some point, those two forces are going to collide. And, um, you know, what will that look like? I think you have to consider that. Um, and every situation, I think, is different. But, you know, coach tells our team this. Uh, is, is, you know, the image of one projects the image of all. So if you bring uh, a particular individual or his behaviors or his way of communicating into your program, um, now it becomes part of your program's identity in, in, in some regard. So, um, you know, we, we, we want our players to be very aware of that stuff, uh, not just for our program's sake, but for, you know, for those guys as they've got, you know, NBA, um, 
GMs looking on their social media pages? Yeah, like they're looking at it the same way. And for some of them, you know, CEOs or um, owners of companies will be looking at their social media pages someday. And um, that kind of stuff is important. Yeah, it is. It's interesting. One tweet, one post could could be damaging to a season, could be damaging to a career. Sure. Let's transition a little bit to, to the team and the culture, you know, currently where you're at. What do you see are some best ways or, or practices to to build that up, to sustain that? Um, and once again, for the people that are listening, whether that's translating it to the sports world, business world, whatever it may be, I think this is all applicable, you know, but what are a couple of things in that area that, that you feel strongly about down there? Well, you know, in terms of our, our team, I mean, um, you know, who we recruit um, is, is super important. We talked a little bit about that, the characteristics that we look for. Um, and I can talk to you about that from an individual standpoint and also from a basketball standpoint. You know, things that we look for, Kevin, from an individual standpoint, character, first and foremost, um, are they good people? They come from good families. Do they want to be a part of something bigger than themselves? Um, so that, that's very important to us. Um, academics, their commitment to academics. I think you have to weigh that in some regards because some kids are going to be committed more than others. But um, I think we, you know, try to avoid for the most part guys that we're going to have to motivate, uh, you know, to go to class and things like that. That's not that's not you know necessarily what we're looking for. Um, you know, guys that want to be coached. Coach uh, Holtman will always say this, uh, you know, I want to coach guys that can get over themselves, okay? And uh, guys that want to be coached, not, not guys that think that they have all the answers. Um, and I think that's really important. So uh, those are some of the probably human characteristics. Um, one, one question that we ask too, I do think this is important, is, um, you know, what is something that this particular recruit has had to overcome in his life. Okay. Because you can learn a lot about a, a young man with um, his response to adversity. And for a lot of these kids, let's be honest, man, like when I was 17 and you were 17 or 18 years old, you know, from a basketball standpoint, uh, I know you were a good player. Like you, you didn't probably have to face a ton of adversity on the basketball court to that point in your life. And some kids haven't had to face true adversity at all to that point in their lives. So we're always digging for that kinds of stuff because um, uh, their ability to respond to adversity, we would call that resilience or grit, um, is, is like, it becomes vitally important when you get to the college level because unless your name is Zion Williamson uh, or if you're a top five pick in the NBA draft, like you are going to face adversity in college like you've never faced before. And uh, so understanding and knowing how they'll respond uh, is, is something that becomes very important to us. Um, you know, from a basketball standpoint, I think words that we use a lot would be toughness, competitiveness, uh, unselfishness, and then basketball character. Um, basketball character, meaning do they play the right way? Are they committed to winning? Um, do they understand uh, things, you know, the, the, the facets of, of basketball? and uh, being on a team that are important to win. Are they committed to that? So for us, it becomes vitally important that we're recruiting guys um, that come from winning cultures and winning basketball programs. So those are things you know, that, that are important to us uh, just from a characteristic standpoint. Um, I know I didn't get into culture yet, but um, you know, more in terms of like the nuts and bolts of what yeah. we look for individually and then you you can build out from there yeah that's awesome i, I don't lace it up anymore but i'm ready to go man I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> I, and i can tell that's that's something that you you guys are adamant about when i watch you play whether you're playing well or playing bad i, I think you can see that so that's that's great so so that culture once they get there and you've created that you know how do you continue to sustain it to me sustainability in anything is is the key. It's, it's the difference maker. You know, it's, it's mm -hmm. what we're striving for every year when we're coaching or when we're heading up a business. So what, what are some key things that you guys do in that area once you have them engulfed into that culture? Yeah. You know, I think, I think it becomes, you know, sustaining the culture, building a culture and sustaining yeah. it I think are two totally different things. Um, you know, when you're talking about building a culture, 
Um, and this is an Urban Meyer definition, but I, I love this. Um, you know, he says, you know, what, what is, what's your view of culture? And his is what, what my team looks like, what it feels like, and what it acts like. Okay. And it, in essence, it's, it's the air that you're breathing in, right? Like how you act, how you interact, how your relationships are, what your standards are, um, all those kinds of things. And I think those are, I think those are, uh, some great points there. So that's as you're building a culture or establishing it. Um, but then how do you, how do you sustain that and how do you maintain that on a daily basis? And, um, you know, we've all heard you are what you emphasize, right? Like you, you are what you emphasize. If you want to be a defensive coach, um, you go to watch a team practice and uh, that's a defensive minded program, you're probably going to see 70 to 80% of the practice centered around defense. Okay. Um, what I would say beyond that, and I, this is probably what I believe even stronger is it's not just what you are, what you emphasize, but it's, you are what you allow. Okay. And what you allow, um, within a, a practice setting, what you allow, um, in a cultural setting in the locker room or off the court, the behaviors that you allow, I think will define you more than anything, um, from a coaching standpoint. So, I think that becomes a very important. I also think when you're talking about sustaining your culture, the consistency that you have as a coach, okay, that's, that's super important. Um, you can't be uh, preaching one thing and doing another, okay? You've got to be very, very consistent and predictable to, to some regard. Um, the connection that you have with your players will allow you to sustain your culture. Ultimately, you want your players fighting for that culture harder than anyone uh, in that organization. And if you're, if you're a player led organization or a player led culture, um, you know, you can look at a lot of successful programs. I, I, I was reading recently about the new England Patriots and the Patriot way. Um, that's a player led organization, whether we, you know, think Bill Belichick is, yeah. uh, you know, the godfather or not, that's a player led organization. And it, it almost runs itself to an extent. It'll be interesting to see with, with Tom Brady not there anymore, how, how that impacts that. But, um, you know, that's a way of doing things. When we were at Butler, we had the Butler way. Yeah. Uh, that was, it was ingrained in the Butler culture for years and years, dating back to Barry Collier. Um, and ultimately you're trying to get that consistent, continued buy-in on a daily basis and relationships are at the, at the, at the core of that. But, um, our ability as coaches to get our players to own their success, own their failures, to own their responsibility, or, or sorry, their behaviors um, is, is critically important. I think when you have that, um, you have a more of a mature team and you've got a team that understands what you're looking for as a coach. Well, well I guess you stole my next thought there, <clears throat> you know, buy-in, <clears throat> excuse me, the buy-in is so important. I always felt as a coach, once you get the buy-in, they'll run through a wall. And I think you answer sure. that in saying that relationships, uh, and that's something I probably didn't appreciate when I was younger, but I value so much more now the older I am. So how, how do you go about, you know, enhancing those relationships? Because I think the, the better relationships you have with the people underneath you, in this case, the players, uh, the more likely they are to buy, to buy in them, right? Yeah, for sure. And that, that can, that comes in all different forms or fashions. I think it's something that I'm really uh, curious about right now, because I think that buy-in for us in this period of time, especially during this pandemic, um, you know, how do we create that in the off season? We create that with uh, work ethic. Um, we create that through our camaraderie, things that we're doing together as a team. Uh, workouts, our energy, our approach, um, our togetherness. Are we together or are we sort of separate? Um, and I think the really good teams we've been a part of, um, there's a chemistry that builds in the off season and you can, you can feel it. Um, so now that buy-in and creating that buy-in is totally different, right? I mean, uh, we're doing Zoom calls once a week. Like that's our only time together as a team or a family, family unit. Um, so um, it's really interesting, man, from a, from a coaching standpoint. I'm, what I'm doing is trying to educate myself personally. I'm reading a lot of articles. 
I'm reading, I'm trying to read some books. Um, and, and this is something I, I need to get better at and want to get better at is making time for that. Yeah, maybe right. that a little bit more right now. Um, and, and just sort of, you know, being, this is another coach Holtmanism, but he says, be where your feet are. Okay. And, uh, I think it's so true. You know, our culture and our society today, there, there's so many things going on. Um, there's social media, there's email, there's text message, there's zoom, there's video messaging. You have all, all of the FaceTime, you have all of these, um, platforms to communicate. And, um, I think that you can get lost in that. And sometimes even I do, I'm reading a book right now. Stillness is the key. Okay. It talks Brian about holiday. Yeah. What's that? Brian holiday, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, I think, I think what it's teaching me is being in the moment um, and being strongly uh, invested in what you're doing at that particular time, rather than going at about 50% here, 50% there, 50%, you know, and you're all over the place. Um, I think that, you know, that's, that's the key. It's a key for me personally, because I think I operate better. Um, I think my relationships are better when I'm, when I'm dialed in on, you know, uh, one particular thing and um, it's not easy to do, but um, something you got to work at. Yeah. That's that daily stoicism from Ryan holiday. I think I remember texting at one point, you're going through a slump this year to read that ego is the enemy. That's another that's right. Another another good book too. I but, downloaded uh, that too. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. good. Awesome. Um, so what's thing? What's one thing here as we kind of wrap up and then kind of get into somewhat of a rapid fire? I like to do. What What's one thing you wish you would have known when you began your career? When you look back at it now, is there anything that sticks out? Um, I would say one thing I wish I would have known would have been um, how difficult this profession is on uh, your family. To be honest with you, I don't think I had any concept of that when I was getting into the business it was I was worrying about myself because I was single and I was out of college and I was chasing a dream and um, uh, it's 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 uh, you know there's a lot of professions out there that require a ton of travel and time and effort and energy but uh, it's unforgiving it's something I didn't know uh, probably when I was 23 years old but right. looking back on it yeah yeah, and it's funny because all that stuff changes when you become, you know, married and when you become a parent. And I think we were talking the other day, it's just really hard to, to get that balance, you know, because you do, you feel like you're, like your example you just used, I'm putting 50% here, 20 here, and so on and so forth. So that, that, is, a, that is a key thing and good advice to somebody starting their career. Sure. Um, you just mentioned some things in reading articles and books. You know, what, what about you? I love to hear different ideas with people. What, what motivates you? What inspires you? What are you doing for growth in, in general? Um, yeah, I'm trying to read a lot. I talk to, I think, I think the people I'm trying to talk to and associate with uh, more regularly are people that I draw energy from, to be honest with you. And for one particular reason or another, sometimes it may be a fellow coach that we can exchange ideas. Um, I talked to a, a sports writer that is a, a good friend of mine and uh, he doesn't live in the area, but he's a good friend of mine. And we talk about a uh, little bit of everything really. And um, i get article ideas from him and he's passed on some things to me uh, recently that allows me to read and learn about other coaches in other sports, which uh, is really cool uh, for me. You know, so I enjoy that. Um, so yeah, that's, I, I just, I, I, I don't know. I enjoy, I enjoy learning. And um, I, I think it's a challenge that I have is, is personally is I'm trying to devote more time to that and uh, you know, manage my time uh, even better than, than I have in the past. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's good. So kind of a, a rapid fire three pointers, if you will, okay. we're going to, we're going to hoist them up. We're, we're down, we're down seven with a minute to go here. But uh, first one would be, I, I think if, if people could take away like one thing from this talk, you know, if, if you could kind of give them something to really hold on to, what would it be? Um, if I were to say one thing, I would say, um, you know, I would say this, and this I'm going to give you a different thought, okay? Because um, we talked a little bit about the pandemic, but um, a talk that I listened to the other day, and this was a, a psychologist from the University of Pennsylvania, 
and it, she, she was tremendous. And her point was, uh, what, do, what do we each want to be when we come out of this pandemic? Okay, what do you, what do you wanna have become from this? Um, because if we are um, the same person when society opens back up and things get back to semi-normal, uh, we're the same person then that we were at the beginning of this. I think we're, we're all missing the boat. And hopefully this is a moment in time that we can all learn from and grow from in some regard. Amen to that. If you could step into my shoes here, hold me accountable a little bit. What, what would have you asked you that I did not ask you today? Is there anything that I missed out on? Um, no, it's been, you could do something. <laughs> You've done a damn good job, man. Uh, well, I appreciate um, that. No, I dodging I, the bullet. Yeah, I, I know. I think I, I don't know. Um, maybe like you know, what are some things that I've uh, feel like I need to grow in, you know, or may, maybe areas that I um, haven't been uh, maybe what I would want to be, you know. Right. And I guess you want me to answer that. Well, if you want, you have a great, a great little nugget in the rapid fire. Go ahead. Yeah, this is this is real rapid, right? <laughs> uh, no, but I, I, I think it's sort of we sort of hit on it. But um, you know, being not really time management, I think is more more than anything. Is is I right. think I learned that successful people uh, are able to manage their time and are able to really dive in um, on a variety of things that make them successful and um, you know that can be learning and growing but it's also connecting with people and doing the things that are most important to uh, being successful in your particular career yeah for sure and then lastly as you know we just call this good stuff um, what, what's some good stuff you could share with us that you think is appropriate maybe for this time or or just in closing here as we wrap up yeah I mean I, I think my, my my thought would be you know um, how can we look, um, you know, this, this is, this has been a different time period, right? It's time standing still to some uh, regard and, and things are a little bit different than they've been, but what can we do for someone else, um, to make their day a little bit brighter? And, uh, that may look, that may, that can look like a lot of different things. It may be a phone call. Um, it may be a thank you. It may be a social media post. It may be, um, you know, our family sent uh, lunches one day to a hospital. Uh, I've got a relative that works in the hospital here in Columbus, and we sent a lunch box lunches to first responders. But I think, if anything, what are we learning from this uh, pandemic and this whole experience here, and how can we um, make somebody's life better um, um, out and getting outside of ourselves? So, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your time. How about uh, you online, Twitter, or the Ohio State website? Where, where can people, you know, kind of connect you or follow your path even more yeah, if sure. they'd like to? Absolutely. I'm on Twitter. Uh, I think it's at Ryan Peden at, uh, at Twitter. And then uh, I'm also on Instagram as well. I believe that's at Ryan Peden as well. Uh, and I'm on Facebook too. So um, and there you go. I'm, I'm probably – a little bit more heavy uh, on Twitter than anything else, but right out there practicing good social media. Trying to, uh, yeah, yeah, there you go. To. Well, hey, Ron, I I really appreciate you, uh, you know, taking the time out of your schedule today to to talk to us and, and give us insight not only to your path, to you, but you know, into the program where you're at now and, and some of those philosophies. And uh, and I always enjoy staying in touch with you. So so thank you very much for being here today. Oh man, thanks for having me, Kevin. What, what you're doing is great, man. I think this is this is awesome, and uh, I'm an advocate for you any day, man. I think uh, you know you're you're a very authentic guy, and I've always uh, you know admired you a lot. So um, I think this is a great thing you're doing, and look forward to following. Yeah, thanks. Just try to continue to have an impact here and apply that message. So uh, thanks again, and uh, until next time, good stuff. <laughs>